big uh, solar photo, uh, installation. So it kind of caters to the general public needs at a, at a very larger scale. Um, so it is not rooftop solar PV, just to be clear. And I'll go into some more details later on. Uh, so utility scale power plants, an assessment of solar photovoltaic development in the state of Arizona. Uh, topic two is dual use of agricultural land, agrivoltaics in the Phoenix metropolitan statistical area. And number three, understanding the relationship between different demographic factors and residential rooftop photovoltaic development for some of the cities in the southwestern US. So let me start with top first before I get into topic one, uh, let me show uh, where Arizona is. So Arizona is one of the um, southwestern states. Uh, as you can see, it's just situated next to California. And um, this is, I don't know how many, I think all of you are familiar with the Grand Canyon. So Grand Canyon is situated here, uh, right on uh, the Northern part of Arizona. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. And uh, it's, um, it's very intriguing, very interesting. And I've, uh, I've been very fortunate enough to uh, go to uh, Grand Canyon. So it's one of my favorite places. And Arizona, as you know, is known as the land of the sun. So it has a lot of uh, solar potential. Now, coming to Arizona's energy mix, uh, only 9% of its total energy production comes from renewable energy. Most of it uh, still now is, comes from coal, which makes 38%. Uh, natural gas, which is 24%, and nuclear, which is 29%. So, uh, uh, and Arizona is growing very fast. The population is projected to increase 40 to 80% uh, by 2050. Uh, and uh, the annual electricity demand is going to grow by an additional 30 to 60 terawatt hours. So the bottom line here is uh, there is a growing population, there is a growing demand uh, and, uh, for energy, and especially in times of climate change, uh, there is a need for cleaner energy. So having said that, uh, let's some, highlight some of the vulnerability of Arizona's current electricity uh, production. Uh, for natural gas, uh, all of the natural gas in Arizona is imported. There is no preserves of natural gas whatsoever. No natural gas storage. Uh, for coal, uh, most of it is, is imported from other resources. There is just one active Arizona mine, which is scheduled to be closed in 2019. And uh, coal generation is in decline in Arizona. And uh, coming to nuclear, uh, Palo Verde nuclear generating station is one of the largest uh, nuclear power plant uh, here in the United States. And it's going to operate until at least 2045. That means there's no long-term plan for it to remain open. Second, there is no active uranium mining processing. Uh, so the future of mining is very controversial here. So, uh, there are a lot of constraints and restraining factor while banking on uh, the other conventional energy resources. So what's the way out? So solar energy is the only domestic energy resource that has the potential to sustainably contribute to state electricity generation. Uh, now let's get into uh, uh, some of the reasons why solar, why do we need solar? So why solar? It's endless, abundant, uh, and as you can see from the map here, this is where Arizona is. It has a very high GHI. Uh, GHI stands for Global Horizontal Irradiance. Uh, in other words, it has very high solar potential. So it's very hot. It can go up to, uh, it's very dry heat out here in Arizona and especially the summer months. Uh, so it has a lot of potential. 
first of all. And second, it is low carbon. Solar power is low carbon. Uh, so it's most of the contribution of CO2 emissions comes from the uh, electric power sector. And solar PV emission is just emits just one percent of the total carbon emission uh, that is generated from a coal plant. Uh, as you can see here, uh, solar power is just generates nearly uh, one hundredth of what any new new coal or coal power plants generates. So it is much more uh, a low carbon. It is clean energy, and it does not need any water at all for its maintenance, for its operation. So in the think about this problem in the context of global world sustainability, where there's water shortage, there's air pollution, there's high carbon emissions, uh, solar power kind of checks all the requirements. So there's less of, there's absolutely no water, little to no water required when compared to other uh, forms of conventional energy. Now there's huge public support uh, for solar power. So uh, in, as this public survey shows, uh, nearly 89% uh, of the total respondents uh, support solar panel farms. Uh, this pattern is similar for other uh, uh, other uh, renewable energy as well, like the wind turbine farm, there's 83% support. Now, why do people support it? Uh, mostly because you save on the utility bills, you save on your electricity bills. To help the environment, it is better for uh, families uh, and you also get a solar tax investment credit. That means if you invest on it, you get a uh, tax cut, you get some benefits, some financial benefits out of it. So there are certain very good incentives on why you can move to solar. Okay. Now, uh, but what's the current scenario in Arizona? Uh, Germany, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the solar potential, solar development there. Germany has uh, invested a lot in solar development. It is one of the leading pioneers in solar photovoltaics. Uh, so uh, let's compare Germany with Arizona. The land area is uh, more or less similar. However, Germany is located much up north in the towards the northern latitudes compared to Arizona. The average horizontal irradiance or the GHI of Germany is nearly half of what Arizona receives, uh, but it produces 38.7 terawatt hour of uh, electricity from just from solar, whereas Arizona even though it receives more than uh, nearly double of the GHI, it only produces one third, one, nearly one third of what uh, uh, Germany produces. So it's just 3.75, uh, nearly one tenth, sorry. Uh, so uh, you can see there is a discrepancy and a lot can be done uh, with uh, Arizona. So now get before I get into the main nitty gritties of my topic, let me uh, just uh, introduce that there are two types of solar generation. One is utility scale solar energy. And what is that? Uh, it's a basically a large scale solar energy generation. You fit into the grid. And so it requires a large area and it needs grid access. Uh, second is the distributed generation. This is the rooftop solar PV. Uh, where you generate the energy at the point of consumption and it kind of reduces grid dependency. So these are the main two types of solar uh, uh, energy uh, generation types of uh, ways in which solar PV is uh, uh, exists. Uh, so what's one of the drawbacks of uh, solar energy, especially the utility scale is that it requires a lot of land to generate a certain amount of energy. So uh, I hear uh, there are three uh, examples. One is the Navajo generating station, which is a coal power plant. So the uh, acre, if we compare the acre 
per gigawatt hour, that is 0 0.15. That means you need this much acre for, to generate one unit of a gigawatt hour of energy. Now, the Palo Verde nuclear generating station, uh, the uh, requirement is 0 0.12. And the Mesquit solar power plant, which is a solar PV project, it, you require 2.15 acres. So when comparing solar PV to nuclear, you need 18 times more land. So when you compare solar PV to coal, you need 14 times more land. So the main take home message is area requirement of solar PV is high. So it's a low energy density uh, a medium. It's a low energy density tool. So having said this, uh, we know that solar energy has a lot of benefits, but it requires a lot of land. So what is it? What is the problem? When we see this problem from a lens of a, an urban planner or an energy planner, it is indeed an energy and a spatial planning issue. So the role of planning and planners in renewable energy is an emerging field everywhere, here in US, in India, everywhere, in China, everywhere. So the low energy density of solar PV systems kind of presents its own spatial challenges. Uh, satisfying the demand of electricity using solar PV is just not an energy issue, but also a spatial planning issue. So it answers, we have to answer while planning, making this transition is where do we develop solar? How do we develop solar? So multi-level planning can provide opportunities for interpretation and implementation of renewable energy planning. And PV development can thus be envisioned at different planning levels, the state level, the metropolitan level, and the building level. So this is kind of a background information uh, on, uh, in terms of the theoretical aspect of uh, the solar and energy planning. So having said this, uh, having setting the background, the research goal of this study is to evaluate the solar photovoltaic potential of Arizona uh, through spatial and energy planning considerations at state, metropolitan, and city levels. So uh, let me start uh, with giving a brief idea about the research questions at the three levels. So my topic one is state level. Uh, here I ask how much land is suitable for solar PV development in Arizona? Where is it located and how would future land cover change affect that availability of suitable land? Second is at the metropolitan level, how can rapidly urbanizing Phoenix metropolitan statistical area uh, and Phoenix, I'll, I'll get into where it is. It's a, ve it's a very growing, rapidly growing city in uh, Arizona. And it is uh, situated in the center of Arizona. So we'll, I'll show you where it is and we'll, we'll talk more about it. Uh, meet its growing energy requirement. And the third is city level. Is there a consistent spatial pattern based on demographic factors? and rooftop PV development in some of the selected southwestern US cities. Now, getting into topic uh, one, I won't repeat the question. Uh, we already know what it is. Uh, so it's a state level analysis. So this study focuses on the suitability of uh, solar farms. Where can solar farms be developed? Now, there, there were several literatures that uh, I found out while doing this research, and it shows that the land suitable uh, for PV development currently varies from location, and you can see the variability. The uh, most favorable land here is 13.98%, and the most favorable land in Oman is 0.5%. So how, how varied the range is from California, from uh, Iran to Oman, sorry. Uh, so that's, it's hugely variable. Now, why is it variable? Because there are certain factors which affects the variability, and my study shows those. Uh, now, I, I won't get into the nitty gritties of, of the, the methods and the data sources. I'll just give a very brief outline of what it is, uh, of how I did this study. So I used a multi-criteria analysis method to find out the suitable uh, area. Uh, so several factors and constraints for PV development were identified. And then uh, 
in this study, uh, Arizona, in Arizona, public opinion was first used as a factor, the perception of people developing solar energy. Uh, the constrained area, that means area where you cannot develop any solar photovoltaic plant was given a score of zero. That means the lowest score possible. And it was considered unsuitable for PV development. And all the factors were scored on a scale of zero to three. Uh, zero being the least favorable and three being the most favorable. Now, uh, I used different tools in ArcGIS to, uh, in S3's ArcGIS to do this. Uh, let's not get into it right now. Uh, I identified six different levels of land suitability, uh, which were excellent, very good, good, average, below average, and poor. Uh, there were several decision-making scenarios which were compared and analyzed. Uh, so where in one of the scenarios, one set of scenarios from one, one to four A, public opinion factors were included. And in scenarios one to four B, public opinion factors were not included. And that kind of uh, varied the result. Uh, now, uh, these are some of the data sources for the constrained areas. And these are the data sources for uh, the factor areas. Now, uh, let me just uh, highlight what factors I took. So uh, under the criteria topography, the slope and aspect of land were taken under location. Distance so can you see the, show the previous slide? Yes. So these are the data sources for the constraints of the solar PV development. So uh, these are the constraints and these are the data sources from where the constraints were, uh, where I received the constraint layers from. Uh, so uh, th this is just nothing but a table of all the data sources that I gathered from. Uh, uh, so should I move on, Abhiradi, to the next slide? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so this is the factors uh, where uh, the criteria. Uh, so under topography, you have the slope and aspect of land. For location, you have distance from transmission lines, distance from roads, highways, and railways. Under resource, you have solar radiation. Uh, and as I said, uh, this was the first time when public opinion was included as a factor. So that uh, under that, I have distance from wildlife, distance from wetlands, a distance from developed areas, distance from places of cultural and historic importance and distance from areas for recreational activities. Now, all these are the data sources uh, for uh, uh, related to the different criteria that I took. So now let's move on to the next slide. This is the constrained area. The orange patches that you see are the areas where you cannot develop solar PV because it has uh, a lot of factors are not uh, suitable for, for this. So the total area of land is nearly 55%. So you don't have a lot of land that is suitable for PV development. Uh, so let's get into the factors that are responsible for uh, solar PV development. Now, uh, this is a map which shows the transmission line and the suitable areas uh, for solar PV development for transmission line, uh, for transmission line, from transmission line. So transmission line is a very important factor for solar PV development. If you don't have the transmission lines to transport your electricity from the place of generation to the place of demand, it's very difficult to uh, transmit that energy. And it is very expensive to make transmission lines, to build new transmission lines. So it is a very important factor. Now, just to give, I, I just show one factor out here. There were several factors that I took. Uh, this is just, and I, I can share the paper that was published uh, with Abhiradi later on, uh, which shows, gets into the details of the different factors. So for this, for the brevity of this presentation, I will just stick to one particular factor. It is over.
Yeah. Any? Should I Is go ahead? Is there any question? Or else mute yourself. Okay. Should I go ahead? Yes, yes. Please participate. Okay. If you have question, post it in the chat box. Okay. And you can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so therefore, different suitability scores were given. Uh, so the red patches that you see, the red box, those are areas where absolutely the transmission lines are far away from the source of generation. So there are no transmission lines. So that gets a score of zero. But uh, within one mile, the transmission line, the, the suitability score is three. That means the distance from transmission line is important. Within one to three miles, the suitability score is two. And within three to six miles, uh, the transmission line uh, is, the score is one. That means the PV development, the land where you can develop PV, solar PV uh, at a utility scale has to be within one mile to get the most maximum score possible. Uh, so this is just one factor that was taken. There were several factors, slope, aspect, uh, and, uh, and uh, solar radiation, distance from roads, et cetera, et cetera. But I won't get into that right now. Uh, so this is the suitability scorecard that I came up with. And the score would depend on the different scenario that were analyzed. The weights would kind of differ from the different scenarios based on the different scenarios. So there were eight different scenarios uh, and within that, four of them we included public opinion and four of them did not uh, include public opinion. Now, finally, coming to the results, you can see two different maps. One for scenario 1A where public opinion was included and one for scenario 1B where public opinion was not included. So with, for scenario 1A, only 0.3% of the land is suitable, is excellently suitable for solar PV development. Whereas in scenario 1B, only 1.8% of the land is uh, suitable for, excellently suitable for solar PV development. So the take home message here is whatever the scenario is, uh, not much land is excellently suitable for solar PV development. So there is an urgency to use that land uh, uh, for solar PV development. So you don't have much land. We can, uh, apparently it looks like there's a lot of land, but there's not much of land that is uh, that where you can develop solar PV. So that's uh, one uh, need, that, that's one important observation that came out from my research. Now, uh, there are different types of technology or different types of solar panels. So the solar efficiency or the uh, amount of electricity that can be generated from a solar panel kind of depends on what type of solar uh, PV is installed on the solar farm. So one example is the Mesquite Solar uh, One, which is a utility solar uh, PV uh, located in, uh, in the Maricopa County, which is in Arizona, uses multi-crystalline solar panels. And it has an efficiency of 20.3%. Whereas another solar plant, which is the Aqua Caliente Solar Project, that is in a different area, uh, but also in Arizona, uses thin film technology, which has an efficiency of 16.8%. So the electricity generated depends, varies considerably on the efficiency of the solar panels. Uh, now, all since energy, this, this uh, entire research was based on the spatial planning problem. Uh, we know that our, uh, we need a lot of land to develop solar energy, at least at the utility scale. But what about in the future? Uh, because there's going to be rapid urban growth. And our Arizona is one of the leading uh, uh, states where there's rapid urban growth because the important cities there are rapidly growing. 
so one example, as you can see here, the ex I, I, I take two examples of excellent land and very good land. So these are the two different criteria uh, categories of land that are that uh, where can be, where PV can be developed. You can see there's a rapid decline of excellent land uh, everywhere. And this is based on the land cover modeling data. So uh, between 2011 uh, to uh, 2060, there will be a 94% reduction of excellent land. So there won't be much land available for solar PV development in the future with the way uh, the rapid urbanization is taking place. So it's a pressing concern. Uh, so this study concludes that not much land is available, not much good and excellent land is available for PV development. Uh, and uh, most of this land is privately owned. And we know that when it is privately owned, it uh, and the real estate developers kind of have a tendency to sell those lands instead of keeping it or preserving it for solar PV development. So it's a pressing concern. Uh, and that land is kind of going to diminish rapidly with rapid urban development. So uh, we need solar PV, but we see that there is rapid urbanization and land is going to decrease. So what do we do? So this brings us to topic two, which is at the metropolitan level. How can the rapidly urbanizing Phoenix metropolitan statistical area, and I'll show you where Phoenix is, uh, meet its growing energy requirement using solar PV. So this is uh, Phoenix. This is the Phoenix city that I was talking about. It is one of the growing cities, fastest growing cities in Arizona. And uh, here uh, in US, uh, cities are often located in counties. Uh, now, this is the metropolitan statistical area. This is the boundary that I was talking about. And it has two counties. One is the Maricopa County and one is the Pinal County. Now, uh, in 1975, this was the aid. This, is, this was Phoenix. 2001, you see, it has grown very rapidly. In 2011, again, it's, sky, it, it's a massive city right now. So these green areas that you see are all agricultural land. And it has, this city has been growing at the expense of this agricultural land. So uh, there has been a nearly 109.1% increase in population. You can imagine how rapidly it has been growing. So the total electricity requirement has also increased uh, between 50 to 95%. And uh, keep in mind, Phoenix MSA has a very low uh, sprawl index. That means it has, uh, it's a very sprawling city. It is not very compact. It is very horizontal. And uh, it is not, um, not very sustainable in terms of its urban uh, form. Uh, now, why do we need agrivoltaic? Uh, it is a multipurpose planning option for any area where there's rapid development, where you don't have much large scale land available for uh, uh, utility scale solar development. It, you, it is a dual use of land and it reduces land commitment for solar PV. It helps to meet the growing demand for carbon free electricity. It preserves and protect agricultural land. It reduces transmission distances. Uh, and it encourages greater urban density. Uh, now, what is the agrivoltaic approach? Agrivoltaic. Agri means agriculture. Voltaic comes from photovoltaic. So it's kind of a marriage between the two concepts. And as you can see here, uh, this, uh, these are the solar panels and it can be developed on the croplands itself. So you can uh, cultivate your crops and you can produce clean energy from the solar panels because, uh, and it kind of gives a shading effect to the crops as well. So uh, this idea was first proposed in 1982 by two German scientists, 
uh, and it allows agricultural fields uh, for the development of solar PV modules at top of a uh, farmland uh, and adequate, it's adequate for continued accessibility. And as you can see, you can see the tractors moving. Uh, and depending on the level of shade, the crop productivity kind of increases. In fact, uh, one of the groups in France, they did this kind of uh, study and found out that the leaf size uh, of a cabbage, of a lettuce plant kind of increases. That means the productivity of the crops kind of increases because of the shading effects of the uh, uh, solar panels. Now, uh, as I said, this is Phoenix uh, from an aerial view, and you can see the urban form here is very spread out. It's not compact. It's not very dense. Uh, so it's a sprawling metropolitan area, and it has a lot of environmental and health concerns. Uh, and due to rapid degradation of cultivable lands, uh, the, there's the native biodiversity is kind of getting hampered. Uh, so that has resulted to degradation of urban air quality and increase in urban heat island effect. Uh, Arizona is in fact the fastest warming state in the whole of US. So there are a lot of negative health effects as well. Uh, and the conversion of agricultural land to urban land leads to higher warming effects compared to other types of land use and land cover changes. So having this, uh, keeping this background in mind, but the question is, why preserve agricultural land? Uh, so the city, cities like Phoenix and Tucson, uh, Tucson is a southern city as well in Arizona. It receives nearly more than 80% of its agricultural products from surrounding uh, cultivable lands, from surrounding agricultural land. Cities, uh, all the surrounding major cities like Los Angeles, San Diego, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, receive their food from these agricultural lands. Uh, about 85% of the farmers who were surve surveyed because of this, uh, uh, of this concept of this research, they said that life farming is a lifestyle for them. Uh, they don't want to get rid of the agricultural lands. They want to preserve that land. So how do we do it? Uh, that may be, agrivoltaics may be one of the answers. Uh, this is again a method and data sources slide. Uh, I won't get into the very nitty gritty, very details of it, uh, of how it was done, how this paper was done. Uh, I can share this paper later on with the, uh, Abhiradi and uh, she can share um, with you uh, if you're interested. Uh, the, these are some of the data sources. Uh, uh, one, thing, one, one major take home uh, message when while I was doing this research was uh, to get any energy related data was a bit of a challenging because it's a very new and emerging field both everywhere. So uh, acquiring some of the data sets has been uh, a bit difficult compared to other forms of research, but it has been an interesting journey as well. Now uh, let's get into the results. Uh, so this uh, map here shows where cultivated land has decreased. Now there are different types of ownership of land. Uh, there's private ownership, there's Indian reservation, uh, that means the tribes, the indigenous tribes, and their state trust. One important uh, factor that you will notice here is most of the cultivated lands have actually decreased in the under private land ownership because most of it has been sold to real estate developers where they have developed those lands uh, for making multiplexes, buildings, houses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Okay, uh, now this is the slope of agricultural land uh, and we can see that nearly 92% uh, of the land uh, is has a very favorable slope has less than five degree of slope which is favorable for uh, solar PV development. Uh, the solar radiation is, as I sh showed you uh, first, that Arizona is the land of the sun. So there's not much variation in solar radiation, 
all of the areas receive a more or less a very high solar uh, mean radiation. So nearly 97.3% of the land falls within plus minus 2% of that mean value. And uh, the energy generated uh, by agrivoltaic systems. Uh, now, let me show you the different types of uh, patterns of energy where, uh, of solar PV installation. Now, there are two ways, mainly the half density panel uh, distribution and the quarter density panel distribution. For the half density, you will see that the solar panels are located in straight lines. There is no gap. In the quarter density, you will see that there's gaps between the solar panels. So that these two conditions were taken for the study. For half density panel dense, uh, for uh, solar PV installation, uh, within a particular service territory. Now there are two different service territories in Arizona. One is the APS service territory and the SRP service territory. Now what is a service territory? There are, these are APS and SRP are public utility companies, which basically provides utility electricity to your uh, houses. So uh, these two companies have their own catchment areas or business areas. So my study found out that with these two types of density patterns, uh, nearly 80% of the total electricity requirement in these service territories can be met. Uh, so this agrivoltaics has a huge uh, potential. Uh, now, getting into the transmission lines, as we have seen before, transmission line is again important. Uh, and my study found out that the agricultural land that are existing are very close to the existing transmission lines. So that's a very plus point for developing agriculture. Uh, shading of crops. Uh, now, again, for the half density panel uh, distribution, where you don't have the gaps, nearly 60% of the direct sunlight is received by the land. Whereas for quarter density, 80% of the direct sunlight is received. Now, this shading of crops is, in fact, a very important factor. Uh, for the productivity of the crops. Now, my study just touches upon this factor. A lot of groups have been working on crop productivity based on the shading of the solar panels. This in itself is a, a different research topic and be a research topic on its own right. Um, now, getting into the energy used by crop types. So uh, this map shows the different types of crops that are growing in uh, that cultivated land. And alfalfa is one of the main crop that grows besides cotton, wheat, and barley. Uh, so the certain amount of energy is required to maintain that, to grow that crop. Uh, so the alfalfa requires 2.2 megawatt hour per acre of energy, well, while cotton requires 4.1 megawatt hour uh, per acre of energy. So my uh, study found out that if agrivoltaic can be developed, it can generate nearly 600 megawatt hour per acre per year with half panel density panel distribution. And this uh, energy use for crop production that you see here is less than 1% of the total energy that can be generated using agrivoltaic systems. So the uh, message here is uh, if you develop agrivoltaics, you can actually use the energy that is generated uh, to uh, crop, uh, to generate, to cultivate these crops. You don't need additional energy from the uh, outside sources. Uh, now, getting into the economic benefits of the agrivoltaic systems. Uh, most of the farmers, what happens uh, here in Arizona is they sell off their land. They find that there's no point cultivating the land. It is so difficult to maintain that land. Why not sell it off to the real estate develop developers for money? So my study, uh, uh, there's assumes that if agrivoltaic system is developed on their farmland, they will have an incentive to keep that land instead of selling that land. And uh, assuming that 
a third party or a utility company gives them one cent per kilowatt hour, uh, then a farmer can actually make a, an addition of, uh, of $6,000 per acre in a year and $150,000 per acre over a 25 year period. So they have a lot of financial incentive just to keep that land. Uh, and uh, my study also found out that the 50% of the agricultural land sales uh, would actually be made up uh, within two years of the agrivoltaic systems. So uh, this uh, map here shows the lands that those were sold off already, the parcels of land that were sold off. So the small agricultural lands that you see here, not just outside, not here uh, surrounding the city, but as you move further away from the city, you can actually make up for the selling price of these land if you install an agrivoltaic system in less than two years. Uh, so this is a great and economic benefit to the farmers. This can be, uh, but there can be several business models to develop uh, this commercial incentive as well. Now, so I'm getting into some of the conclusions. I won't uh, read all of them. Uh, just to uh, go through them, uh, just to highlight a few. The main purpose is to reduce land commitment. That's the main purpose. Uh, so uh, we see that agriculture, solar PV requires a lot of land, but how can we rec uh, reduce that land commitment? So that's what agrivoltaics does. You can do crops, you can grow crops, you can keep your agricultural land, but you can also uh, generate cleaner electricity. Now, is there a global application for this kind of research? Yes. Uh, I, uh, this paper is still under development and uh, I'm yet uh, to publish it, but uh, this shows different agricultural lands in different, uh, in all international cities, in some of the growing international cities. So it has a lot of potential. This concept has a lot of potential. Uh, now let's get into the third topic, which is the city level. Uh, is there a consistent spatial pattern based on demographic factors and rooftop PV development for cities in southern, uh, southwest US? Uh, now, why rooftop PV? Uh, there are certain advantages. It uses the existing building footprint instead of the additional land area. Uh, so if you don't have agricultural land, if there's not much suitable land left, uh, why not develop solar rooftop PV? So the fact that rooftop solar does not take any additional space does not take a uh, hookup or transmission lines, does not take any additional uh, buffering or load following beyond what the local grid already has, rooftop solar PV is the way to go. It's definitely a very good answer to this growing energy demand. Uh, now, US Department of Energy uh, has an initiative uh, where they kind of came up with solar PV development in some of the Southwestern US cities. Now, uh, Tucson, as I uh, mentioned before, this is where Tucson is. It's the southernmost city, uh, very close to the Mexico border, and this is where Phoenix is. So it's uh, nearly two hours, uh, two and a half hours of driving from Phoenix uh, to Tucson, uh, nearly uh, roughly. And it is uh, very hot. It has a lot of solar potential. Uh, so it. <coughs> solar energy development plan and to increase the number of solar PV installations in the city. Uh, so go, getting into the background and literature uh, review, uh, I, we see that my study found out there's not much of a, a suitable land left uh, for in future. That's what the projection shows. There's not much of an agricultural land left either because uh, cities like San Diego and Tucson have less than 1% of their agricultural land. So we cannot develop utility scale. We cannot develop agrivoltaics. What's the solution? Rooftop installations. And now I was involved in a part of uh, study where uh, I found out uh, 
for nearly 3000 rooftops, the solar potential. So each rooftops were digitized uh, by one of my colleagues. And I was involved in a project where I found out the solar potential for each of these rooftops. It was a very interesting study. So this kind of gave me an idea that how is demographic characteristics like uh, income, education, age, uh, uh, educational attainment, how can all this uh, factor the technical potential or rooftop PV solar installation? Is there a relationship at all? Uh, so these are the southwestern states, US states that I was talking about. And as you can see, it has a very high solar radiation. Uh, now, it has been found uh, that uh, near, uh, it's an, there has been an interesting study by Sigrin and Muni, which found that nearly 70% of residential electricity consumption in the US can be met if rooftop PV installations are done. And one interesting found, uh, fact that they found out is the high income group uh, people, they can actually uh, support, uh, they have suitable buildings, 29.4 million suitable buildings in, in that in, uh, income group. So a lot of energy can be generated from that. Now, uh, this is my study. This is where I found out that uh, the PV installations that have been taking place uh, by zip code, there's a strong correlation between uh, the PV installations and the population centers. So where there's high population, there's a very strong correlation in uh, number of PV installations. Uh, this is for California and this is for Arizona. Uh, now, there are some of the background literature uh, that I found out in this regard uh, is, uh, depending on the demographic characteristics like income and education, uh, PV development is uh, varies significantly. Uh, in Texas, for example, an average PV adopter is more educated and at higher income. Uh, now, whereas in early adoption of rooftop solar in the US has been primarily concentrated in higher income households. A recent study on in Australia showed that education and knowledge were not significant in the adoption of rooftop PV. Uh, so you can see that there has been some contradictions in the study. Some studies say that the education and knowledge were important, whereas other studies showed that no, it's not important at all. Uh, so what needs to be done is a detailed study needs to be done on this uh, topic. And uh, I found this to be very interesting because of the existing conflicts as well. Uh, again, uh, let me not get into the details of the methods uh, and the data sources. Um, uh, I'm going to share the slides and if you are interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, my data, uh, I, I'll just mention two data sources here. One is the Open PV Data Project. So it's a project that is funded by the NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So they have, uh, they give you the data on the number of PV installations by zip codes. And uh, uh, for the demographic factors, I uh, took the data from the American Community Survey. Uh, now let me get into the main study here. Uh, I took selected eight cities. Uh, because the, these cities have significantly higher zip codes, uh, which had a lot of solar installation. So, uh, and the cities were Los Angeles, Sacramento, San Diego, San Francisco, San Jose, Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. All of these had significantly higher uh, solar PV uh, installations in their zip codes. Uh, now, getting into some of the results. Now, this study is still under development. So these are some of the preliminary results that I'm presenting. Uh, I'm planning to work on this in the future and get it uh, probably get it published soon. Uh, so what I found out was in the cities of Phoenix and Tucson, the PV installations have a very uh, uh, positive relation with race. That means white population who are well to do 
uh, they can afford higher PV installations. They can afford to set up PV on their homes. In Sacramento, on the other hand, there's a positive correlation between Asian population and PV installation. Uh, now, education, the, I found out, that is not a major factor in Phoenix and Tucson. Uh, whereas in San Francisco, uh, zip codes with high PV pers uh, installations have higher percentage of population with, with bachelor's degree or higher. So you can see it kind of varies from one location to another location. Um, so that's interesting. The median age varies from 34 to 40 years in Tucson while it varies from 35 to 44 years in Phoenix. Uh, unemployment rate is very is low in Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. So uh, uh, if people who are employed, people who uh, make up a certain amount of money can actually afford uh, solar PV on their homes. Uh, by the top five zip codes in the major five cities of California have widely varying demographic characteristics uh, like San Jose, San Diego, San Francisco have much higher percentage of population with bachelor's degree uh, compared to Sacramento and Los Angeles. Percentage of Asian population is again much higher in the top zip codes of San Jose, San Diego, San Francisco, and Sacramento. Now, all these cities that I'm talking about, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Bay Area. It has a technical hub. So those, those, those are the areas where you have Google, you have Facebook, and every other companies are situated in those areas. So those are research and technical hub. So it makes sense that they will go for PV development. Uh, now, household income and owner-occupied housing shows the strongest correlation in most cities. Median age has a positive correlation with PV installation in major cities except for Las Vegas and San Francisco. Education tend to have a positive correlation with PV installation, again, except for Las Vegas and San Francisco. And we need to point, uh, I, my research is again looking into why this is not the case uh, in Las Vegas and San Francisco, and I'm still yet to find out an answer for that. Uh, so coming into the conclusions, uh, we found out that household income and owner-occupied housing, uh, where a person owns a house rather than renting a, a an apartment has a strongest correlation. Uh, in Phoenix and Tucson, uh, zip codes with higher PV installations have a dominant white population. Uh, San Jose, San Diego, San Francisco have a high percentage of population with bachelor's degree. So education is an important factor here. Uh, and median age has a positive correlation with PV installation in major cities. Uh, education is again a very important factor in all the cities except for Las Vegas and San Francisco. And the relationship, the most important take home message here is the relationship between demographic factors and TV installation varies significantly from one city to another. So that's, that's what my research found out. Uh, and more uh, research needs to be done to uh, support this fact. So just summing up my entire presentation, I know it has been long, it has been lengthy, and I am, uh, uh, if you, <laughs> I know you guys might be bored to death, but just bear up with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, what my research sums up is, it's a transition to renewable energy. This transition is very required in terms of climate change, global warming, and this transition can influence the energy mix and may change the existing spatial pattern for the area. Uh, in this context, renewable energy planning and spatial planning are all integrated. Those are not two different things. Those are not two different disciplines. Those are interconnected. This research is a step towards this energy space nexus. In this work, PV development is analyzed at three different planning levels or spatial planning levels. The state level, where you see the utility scale solar development, the metropolitan level, where you see the agrivoltaics development, and the city level, where I try to establish a relationship between different demographic factors and solar PV installations. 
uh, analyzing all the three different planning levels will help in proposing future policies and development schemes for both utility scale and rooftop solar PV development in the state of Arizona. So my work here is just a blueprint uh, for a energy plan, energy development plan for the state of Arizona. And this concept can be applied everywhere. It can be applied to any energy planning in Kolkata, in Delhi, or anywhere in India, or anywhere in other developing countries as well, uh, depending on the urban form, depending on the requirement. But the basic uh, premise remains the same, that we need to make this energy transition, but how do we do it? Uh, so this was my uh, presentation. Um, thank you. If you uh, if you have any questions, um, um, just feel free to ask. I uh, just stop sharing my screen for the time being. Yes, Regulina, thanks a lot. Actually, I think many of the participants, especially the students, have come to uh, you know know about a entirely new set of research field in which we can re really explore. Because this is not the very stereotypical or the kind of work that goes on. The very new kind of uh, field. There is a lot of opportunities to explore. And there are a lot of questions also. Uh, yes. <laughs> So I, I can't just, that while presenting. Yes, I'm yeah. happy to answer. Yeah, yeah, I'll uh, start with some of them. Uh, Chandan Shurobi Dash, sir, has asked uh, Do you consider rooftop areas for calculating uh, land in case of city habitants? What is the transmission cost of solar energy compared to others if demand arises? Yeah, that's a very good question. It has a lot of questions packed into one single question, though. Um, I have to, I don't have the specific figures for this right now. Uh, I can, um, the, in fact, what happens with, I can give a very general answer. So what happens with uh, rooftop PV is that it's distributed in nature. So the transmission cost is very minimal because you generate it on your home and you um, you can actually use that percentage of solar for for your own consumption as well and the excess you can actually give it to the grid so that's net metering uh, but the but for utility scale, uh, what happens is it it the cost of transmission is very important because uh, that's where it, it's a mass generating site and you can uh, transmit the energy from the place of demand to uh, from the place of origin to the place of demand but the cost how it varies uh, I need to I, I need to give uh, see some of the facts and get back to him uh, but the main uh, I can say this that the cost is comparatively very very low in distributed generation in fact uh, there's um, Sometimes it can be zero as well uh, when compared to the utility scale. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another. I, I answered uh, his question, but that's the that's the generic concept. Yeah, but I can. Is is online, uh, he can uh, ask himself if he's uh, if he's available. You can unmute yourself, sir, and uh, you can ask the question. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, move to the next question. Uh, in case so, of Arizona, hello? yeah, yes, sir, please. Hello, just yes. another, another another question to Madam. Hello. Yes, but I was... yes, audible. Okay, okay. Yeah, what is the unit cost of solar compared to uh, other the, like the water or coal? The unit cost is too much high in case of India. And what is yes. in yes. case of Arizona? Yeah, I uh, the unit cost. I have to sir give you the exact number. I don't remember it right now, but I know that it is it is still higher. But I have been working with a person, a, a scientist who has been developing the solar panels. So his uh, research is underway to make the unit cost lower, uh, because as with technology development. 
uh, it has been uh, the cost has actually come down comparatively when you compare it with a decade. Actually, that is uh, the main problem for not popularizing solar against yes. the concept of non-carbon energy. That is the main problem yes. throughout the world. Yes. Maybe yes. Of India. Yes, absolutely, and uh, that may that is one of the challenging factors that is one of the inhibition that people don't want to install solar because the initial cost is very high still now it is high uh, but i i uh, but i this is the general idea but uh, i can give you the facts uh, comparative chart i don't have i don't remember it off the head i don't want to give you wrong numbers okay, okay. Uh, so but yes you 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 have correctly pointed out so it yeah. also depends on the state policies, on the incentives that the different states give. Like in Arizona, I'm in Florida right now. I, I We moved to Florida. Florida doesn't have a much of uh, state incentive uh, till now to develop solar. So I don't see a lot of rooftop, rooftop solar out here. Yeah. But when back in Arizona, a lot of utility companies, the state, uh, the state public service commission as well, who control this kind of policies, they got in hand in hand with the different utility companies and they had those incentives uh, to bring down the under cost. And there are different financial models that are in place as well, uh, which kind of, you can rent your uh, roof to a third party. So you don't need to buy that solar. They can just install it on your rooftop. So, and, but you can use that electricity and you can feed into the uh, this, uh, to the grid as well. So the different business models that are in place. Uh, so that's in fact a very important research um, field in itself. Thank you, Anna. this is very a new idea and the research is very much related to the present warming situation of the global climate change. Right. Right. Thanks again for your uh, research in a new and emerging area. Okay, thank yes. you, thank, thank you, Madam. Thank you, thank you. Some of my students has been asking, explain global horizontal irradiance, GHI, if you could shortly like explain. Yeah, so global horizontal irradiation is basically the solar radiation that falls on the Earth's surface. It's basically the total solar radiation that an Earth that a person that an Earth surface receives directly. It's the direct beam that reaches the Earth's surface uh, without getting uh, absorbed by other atmospheric. Uh, it, it's the amount of total solar energy that reaches, actually touches the Earth's surface. So that's global horizon to the radiation. Okay, another question is, uh, maybe you have mentioned in your uh, slide that uh, the uh, distance from the wetland may help in the solar photovoltaic development. So how is, uh, how does the distance effect? The distance from the wetland uh, helps in uh, solar PV development, how? Oh, so what, when I mentioned distance from wetland, it is one of the factors. It is one of the public opinion factors. So uh, in a survey, it was asked, and this survey was done all over the US, that do you consider solar PV development uh, near the wetlands? Do you think it is a good idea to do that? So uh, the fact, it's a factor because Many people said, no, I don't want it uh, within one mile of the wetlands. But yes, if it can be developed within three miles, three to five miles of the wetlands, then definitely it's a good factor. So my study takes in that public uh, opinion and says, uh, OK, so the area, there are wetlands or uh, natural habitat areas in Arizona. So if the land, within taking that factor into consideration, if that particular land can be developed, solar PV can be developed after three miles or five miles, then it will get a score, higher score of three. So wetlands is a factor uh, that was considered for public opinion. Uh, so I uh, hope I answered the question. Yeah. Uh, there's another question uh, by Poushali Rai. Is every voltaic suitable in Indian agroclimatic conditions? I, uh, can you repeat the question? Is agri voltaic suitable in Indian agroclimatic conditions? Uh, I that needs 
I won't give a direct answer to that because that's a very um, empirical study that needs to be done because we need to actually set up uh, an agrivoltaic system and see how it functions uh, in a climate, in a monsoon uh, dependent climate. Uh, but India too has different geographic regions. Uh, for, for example, Kolkata will respond differently or farmlands in uh, West Bengal will respond differently to uh, farmlands in Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh or in Kerala. So, uh, but I, uh, I have no direct answer for that, but I can definitely say that there have been international um, uh, projects that have done this kind of agrivoltaic development. It has been done in Japan, it has been done in China, it has been done in Europe, France, Germany. So, uh, and those are very different geographically in terms of climate and weather conditions as well. So probably that's an interesting uh, collaborative work that can be done with India to find out whether that can yeah. be done. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, from you to you, we have a question. Uh, for this type of study in India, what are the required data and are they free of cost or need payment? Uh, I am not very familiar with uh, the details about the data in India because I my entire work was based on here in US. Uh, but the general, uh, uh, my impression would be some, it would be challenging to get uh, some of the data like the data for transmission lines. Uh, but uh, I probably an energy expert from India would be better answering that question because, uh, uh, but, but we can definitely get uh, all the physical data, for example, uh, the national elevation data, the slope, the aspect, the GHI, all these things can be available readily, uh, the weather data. Uh, but the other part of it, like, uh, I don't know whether there has been a study that, uh, that has been done for the public survey, uh, like if you want to include public opinion. Uh, maybe those kind of data, the distance from transmission lines, whether there are existing GIS layers for transmission lines, um, those kind of data probably needs to be looked at. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's, that exists uh, uh, so far. A lot of data creation is required. Uh, yes, in for that area. kind of thing. And yes. maybe that requires a certain kind of state or central funding to do that kind of to generate that kind of data set. Uh, I think I have uh, asked you most of the questions. And uh, if anyone has to say something or express their opinion about the uh, entire program, please feel uh, free to come forward. And uh, you can unmute yourself one by one and can ask some questions. Is anybody ready to share your opinion regarding the entire webinar? It will be really nice. Okay, I think people are feeling shy. <laughs> so, uh, I would... Uh, okay. I just want to ask one thing. Hello? Yes, you are audible, Shatabdi. Please go ahead. Okay. I just want to ask one thing that uh, there, sh the speaker men mentioned that there are some factors which are not suitable for establishing the solar planning in an area. So uh, can you please explain or uh, in a detailed way that which are the factors, major factors, which are not suitable for establishing the solar planning in an area? Yes. Uh, thank you, Shatabdi, for the question. Uh, so there are several factors, like, for example, slope. Uh, if a slope of a land uh, is greater than five degree, for example, that land is not suitable for uh, uh, the, at least the study that literature review points out that that land is not suitable for uh, solar PV development. Uh, like, for example, I, sh I showed you the picture of Grand Canyon. Like if you want to build a solar PV panel on the slope of Grand Canyon, naturally it's not suitable. Second is uh, where there is GHI is also an important factor, the total solar radiation that is received. Uh, generally areas with high GHI, 
uh, have a better, uh, better uh, favorability factor. That's one thing. Uh, areas, for example, where you have natural habitat, uh, forested lands, those are not suitable for, uh, those are any ways you cannot develop large scale utility scale because you cannot clean up the forest. Uh, so these were several uh, factors, like for example, rivers. If you have a river, uh, and uh, we know that river fronts, the side of the river banks, are very, very uh, sensitive, biosensitive. You cannot simply go and develop it on the just next to the river. You need to create a buffer, and you they need to leave out a certain space, and then the land after that may be suitable. So there are a lot of environmental and geographical factors like this, uh, like the distance from roads. Uh, how far are if if a plant site is very far away from road, then definitely it's not a very good idea. You need to be closer to the road because you need to while constructing a power plant you need access to uh, that road uh, so these are the different factors uh, i i can share my uh, paper with uh, all of you and you can with uh, abiradi and she can uh, forward it to you and you can go through the different factors where uh, i talk about more of the about them in details Okay, some of the graduate uh, students are asking what is photovoltaics and uh, what is a PV installation? If you can briefly. Yeah, so there are different technologies of solar uh, installation. So one is photovoltaics. So photovoltaics is generally the cell based solar. Uh, uh, electricity generation. I'm not an engineer by profession, so I won't cannot give you the exact engineering definition of it. But conceptually, uh, it's uh, solar panels, when you install the solar panels, the ones that you sh I showed you in the picture. So those are uh, like uh, very flat based uh, panels that you can install on the roof, you can install on the ground, you can install on a cultivated land as well. So that's solar photovoltaics. That's one type of solar uh, energy generation method. Other one is the CSP or the concentrated solar power plant where you have these towers, massive towers, and you have this parabolic troughs, which kind of concentrates uh, the solar panel, uh, solar energy to that particular trough. And there is a liquid which kind of evaporates and then pushes uh, the, uh, it, it kind of changes that liquid to vapor and it, it generates electricity. It runs the turbine based on the vapor and uh, it kind of produces electricity. But the main difference between CSP and solar photovoltaic uh, is CSP requires a lot of water in its process, in the energy generation process. But solar PV is very, very uh, less in uh, water intensive. It just requires water to probably clean the dust that settles on the solar panel, that's it but not in the energy generation process. So this is the main, main difference. Another question from Nirmita Dikpati. How much minimum range of solar radiation is required to set up a solar PV system? Is there any minimum requirement? There must be, yeah. Yeah, minimum requirement, I, uh, exactly don't remember. I can't give you the exact number as of, I just, it's off the head. But I can uh, definitely, as, as I showed in one of my slides, there is Germany, there is Arizona. Germany has a very uh, low GHI, nearly 1,000, uh, 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 less than nearly half of Arizona. But uh, it has a lot of energy, put it, it has nearly double that of energy potential that of Arizona because there are a lot of solar PV installations. Now, if you ask me what amount of uh, threshold that is required, I need to take, uh, see that and get, get back to you. Uh, definitely, uh, you, uh, if it can be done in a temperate, climate like Germany, it can be done in a tropical climate like uh, uh, India as well. Uh, so it cannot be zero, definitely, <laughs> but it has to be a greater than that. But uh, the exact number, it can vary. 
from climatic regions. Uh, that's one thing that we should take into consideration. Uh, but the average value, I need to uh, see that and get back to you. Okay, thank you, Devolina. I would request all the participants to please uh, switch on their videos. Uh, there will be a snapshot taken with our resource persons. So kindly, uh, Devolina, please uh, do the required uh, procedure. Please, everyone, uh, switch on. Uh, your... I have another question. Actually, uh, I want to yes, know sir. in an elaborate. Uh, what is, uh, you mentioned that uh, the service territory, APS and SRP. So can you please elaborate the concept? Yeah. I just want to know. Yes. yes. Um, uh, so SRP and APS I, uh, I, uh, are utility companies. Like I uh, like CSC, I you still have CSC. I, I have been long uh, outside home, so please forgive me if I am getting it wrong. So you still have CSC, right? The electricity yes. company who gives you power to Kolkata. Yes. Huh. So, yes. Something like that. But there are two utility companies in uh, uh, in Arizona, especially in the Phoenix metro area. So one is the APS, the Arizona Public Service. And the one is the SRP, the Salt River Project. So these are two utility companies, which are the uh, which kind of are the duopolies in uh, in Arizona, and they produce uh, generate electricity and they distribute it at the residential at the commercial level. Uh, so they have their own business area. So beyond that, that's their APS territory, and beyond that, that's the SRP territory. Beyond that. Uh, well, there are very small other territories, but those are very non-existent. They are these are the two uh, la main major utility companies out there. So by service territory, I mean the catchment area or of their service, the territory to where they serve. So there are two different. The, those are the two major service territories, and okay. the agricultural lands kind of falls in uh, in or mostly in those two service territories. So you can uh, definitely use them. Uh, for okay. Uh, Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, Shatabdi, please, please, you may proceed first. Please, Shatabdi. No, no, you just uh, ask, then I will ask. It's okay. Okay. Uh, so my, my, my question is, I hear the manufacturing of the PV panel create toxic by product and waste. Is it true? Uh, this, that, this is one of the, uh, uh, it's a, I won't say it's a debated issue, but it's, some of them has raised this issue. I went to visit a power plant. Uh, it's, it's a research lab where uh, one of the researchers, actually he's the head of that research lab where he uh, tests those solar panels before it is sent out to companies. So I asked the same question to him. So he said that if you burn a couch, if you just lit a match and if you burn a couch, the amount of CO2 that is generated, it's very, nearly 10 times higher than the one that is involved in the life cycle process of the solar panel generation. So you get my point. It is so negligible compared to the other processes that we go through every day, the smoke, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the buses, the smokes, the industry chimneys, etc. which is compared to that, it is very negligible. And with development of technology, with the creation of the, the, the cells that actually make the solar panels, uh, with technology development, that toxic elements, that's what researchers are trying to do, to minimize the impact of CO2 emissions. But uh, it, this is like comparing apples to oranges. I mean, it is uh, absolutely uh, uh, tiny compared to the ones that we face here. Uh, with all the, the issues that we have. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, Shadabdi, please. Uh, uh, OK, uh, I just want a suggestion that as India has a rapid growing population and uh, the urban areas are also expanding, so the there's decrease in the agricultural land. And so uh, how to develop the solar planning in areas um, 
in india that is that what you are asking is in, is in fact a very good premise for a collaborative project that can be done with india uh and uh, i believe india is already a taking a path towards cleaner energy uh, and i've found uh, i've read uh, in some of the articles where the canals the existing canals are covered by solar panels uh so th it's not that yeah. that nothing has started but yes uh, more needs to be done and since it's a developing country we have a lot of energy requirement which is undeniable we need that energy for our development but how to produce that clean energy is in fact uh, uh, and what are the different innovative ways because one model that may work here in us may not work uh, in completely india. in india as well we need to take into the cultural factors the political factors the economic factors as well so uh, yes agrivoltaic is a definitely worldwide application it's not that it cannot be done but how it can be applied is the uh, is uh, in fact a research question that needs to be pondered uh, and uh, we can definitely work on this later on uh, if we, but it's it's uh, in fact uh, a great opportunity to work on later on uh, yeah so you ask a very um, you in fact set the background for a phd question if you <laughs> thank you uh, so i think uh, the question session is over and uh, as uh, devasuta had requested me please everyone switch on your videos and we can take a snapshot meanwhile i would like to thank uh, everyone all the participants who have you know uh, woke up uh, you know after their lunch and uh, have uh, joined us uh, uh, and also i would like to thank them the all the participants who are on youtube in the previous sessions as well as in this uh, session and uh, my organizing team where devobhuto has played one very pivotal role without who help i would have been nowhere i would like to thank uh, shantanu mondal uh, jayashri karmakar moshumi karmakar shanchita banerji and nabhamita mukhopadhyay who are my colleagues in the department definitely uh, professor shamu chhatra and our principal sir professor siddharth gupta and many of my other friends uh, who have also in directly or directly help me uh, in different ways in getting accustomed to this new uh, normal so uh, thanks a lot and uh, please be assured that your feedback comes with from will be mailed to you within a week's time and you can definitely revisit our youtube channel where this uh, live streaming has been uh, put up so that you can revisit revise uh, the lectures given by our speakers uh, and even search by yourself new terminologies that you have heard for the first time and uh, try out uh, exploring facts and uh, yes 40% is the cut off marks maybe i'll be lenient as well <laughs> but uh, yes i want people to actually listen uh, to the lectures very carefully and hence i have put this uh, thing because uh, most of us uh, generally do log in and then go off and uh, you know do other household activities so i didn't want that to happen so i made it sure that people should uh, answer to the questions there will be mcq and short questions uh, one liners Uh, which you have to fill up in the google form that will be sent to you and once i get it uh, you will get your uh, e certificate so devobhuto is the snap uh, taken yes yes ma'am okay thank you devolina i think it's time for your breakfast <laughs> yes i'm hungry <laughs> yeah. thanks a lot for waking up so early and uh, thanks to all the participants Uh, thank you so much yes. so we can end the session yes thank you take thank care you. bye stay safe all of you thank you ma'am thank you bye, -bye. bye.